I'm Adam. And I'm Chick. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. Hey, Chick, are you a basketball fan? I grew up a Cleveland Cavaliers fan, which was tough because they were almost always bad or middle of the pack. But then, when I was in college, we got this kid named LeBron James. So, having one of the greatest basketball players ever on your team made you a fan? It sure doesn't hurt. Having someone like him play for your team gets people interested in the sport. And people like me that were fair weather fans start paying attention way more. In today's book, we see how a team with a sneaky name opened up opportunities that had never been seen for black basketball players. Let's get started. Swish, the slam dunking, alley ooping, high flying Harlem Globetrotters. Written by Suzanne Slade. Illustrated by Don Tate. It all started with those boys thump thumping basketballs up and down Chicago's South Side in alleys, driveways, and parking lots. Raw talent and determination in worn out sneakers, practicing non stop layups, all net free throws, and sky high jump shots. When their team charged into Wendell Phillips High wearing those official school jerseys, every student grew an inch taller with pride. Their players were unstoppable, division champs. Everyone could see they had as much talent as the country's best hoopsters, but the top teams only recruited white players. So after graduation, those Wendell Phillips stars joined traveling teams for black players. Before long, a few players met a small man with a big dream. Abe Saperstein, who helped them form their own team, the Harlem Globetrotters. The name sounded grand, like they'd played all over the world. Well, not quite. But they barnstormed their way across America, little Abe and five giant players, Toots Wright, Kid Oliver, Fat Long, Runt Pullins, and Andy Washington. They squeezed into an old Model T and chugged from town to town searching for anyone who would play. Farmers, students, lumberjacks, and people would pay to watch. Seven nights a week, the road-weary team played ball, healthy, sick, or injured, and won nearly every game. But hometown fans didn't like out-of-town hotshots skunking their team. Soon, the Trotters came up with a plan. Smack in the middle of the game, each player performed a ball-handling trick while the others took a short rest. Crowds howled with delight at the surprising sights. One finger ball spinning, rapid fire mini dribbling, and a ricochet head shot. Suddenly people didn't mind when the hilarious trotters beat their team. You're a pretty tall guy. Did you ever play basketball, Adam? When I was a kid, I had a basketball hoop in my yard and I played with neighborhood kids all the time. But I never actually tried out for a school team. Why not? To be honest, I don't know why. It's one of my biggest regrets from my high school days. Could you dunk? I wasn't the greatest, but I could dunk. I actually broke my neighbor's backboard once. Did you get in trouble? It was old and made of wood. Probably would have fallen down without me breaking it. What about you? Did you play basketball? I don't know if you know this, but hippos can't actually jump on land. So I'll take that as a no. The Globetrotters played wherever they could. Barns, basements, even the bottom of dried up swimming pools. The crowds laughed and cheered. But as soon as the game ended, the cheers stopped. The tired, hungry players weren't always welcomed in hotels or restaurants. They couldn't use most gas station restrooms or phones. Nearly every drinking fountain wore a whites only sign. Downhearted yet determined, a new fire fueled their game. The Trotters would prove that all players, all people, deserve to be treated the same. With their fancy footwork, fast passes, and one-handed dunk shots, they played the most breathtaking, groundbreaking ball the country had ever seen. Years bounced by. Older players retired, new ones stepped in. Goose Tatum, the clown prince, who rolled that ball across 84 inches of steel-strong arms. Marquise Haynes, a dazzling, dizzying dribbler with lightning-fast hands. Boyd Buey, a spectacular sharpshooter who had only one arm. 
With their slapstick tricks and pinpoint shots, the Trotters game became known as The Show. They made the game look so easy, people didn't even notice their incredible talent. But this team was more than a show. They were skilled athletes, expert players, and electrifying performers, all rolled into one, professionals at the game. But the professional basketball teams didn't allow black players. Determined to make people see their talent instead of their skin color, the Globetrotters challenged the best team in the National Basketball League, the mighty Minnesota Lakers. What? You could almost hear the nation gasp. A pro team play those high-flying showboats? How ridiculous! Yet the Lakers agreed. They couldn't wait to trounce the Trotters. Shivering fans lined up outside Chicago Stadium in middle of the night darkness on February 19, 1948. People across the country slapped down sure beds. Easy money, no way the Lakers could lose. They had a six foot 10 giant, George Mikan. Surrounded by a raucous record-breaking crowd, the Globetrotters jogged out in a comical striped shorts, but they left their tricks behind. Tonight was straight up serious ball. Right from the start, Goose stuck to Mikan like gum on a shoe. Yet Mikan quickly scored 18 points and blocked every shot Goose put up. By halftime, the Lakers were ahead, but the Globetrotters fought back and tied the game. The Globetrotters were like the little engine that could, or the extremely tall that could. I knew about them as a team of tricksters, but I didn't know what they did to break the racial barrier in professional basketball. Tricksters? You know, they're always performing funny trick shots and dribbles. It looks like one of the biggest tricks that they performed was convincing the Lakers to play against them. Who do you think will win? First off, everyone likes rooting for the underdog. Secondly, this is a book about the Harlem Globetrotters, not about the Lakers. Right before the end of the game buzzer, the Trotters sent one last shot soaring toward the net. Swish. Globe Trotters win 61-59. Without saying a word, the Trotters showed the world that players with different skin colors belonged on the same court. The Lakers demanded a rematch. The win was a fluke. A year later, the teams faced off again, and the Trotters won again. Now the most popular team in America, the Globe Trotters played to sold out stadiums and signed a Hollywood movie contract. Meanwhile, NBA teams were barely selling enough tickets to pay the bills. Frustrated team owners gathered to pick next season's recruits. One by one, they carefully considered each athlete's talent, and suddenly their whites-only rules seemed ridiculous. Then something incredible happened. The Celtics owner announced an astounding choice, Chuck Cooper, one of the most remarkable players he'd ever seen, and one of the Globetrotters' newest recruits. Soon, another owner declared his top picks. Two more phenomenal black players. And the game was never the same. It became nonstop, give it all you got. Out to win it, sky's the limit, basketball. After breaking into the NBA, the Globetrotters broke out into the world. They played in a dusty building in Peru, in a cow pasture in New Zealand, and on a court built over barrels in Germany. The crowds were astonished by their slam dunks, alley-oops, and other high-flying surprises. They made thousands of new friends, met popes, princes, and presidents, and even sipped tea with the Queen of England. They shared their joy, laughter, and warm friendship with nations around the world, even ones who weren't friends with the United States. Back home, the Harlem Globetrotters were named America's Ambassadors of Goodwill. How about that? The team that brought black and white America closer together brought the world a little closer together too, and lived up to their Globetrotter name after all. The shot heard round the world, and not the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Do you think that the Globetrotters would have initiated so much change for black athletes if they wouldn't have won that game? Unfortunately, we'll never have to know. But keeping that in mind, Winston Churchill once said that history is written by the victors, which is kind of funny because the Harlem Globetrotters are always playing and beating the generals. Hmm, I never thought about that. Yeah, they go from beating the generals to making a worldwide tour playing wherever people will have them. Like the book said, they lived up to the Globetrotter name after all. I love it. 
And speaking of loving things, if you love this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm Adam. And I'm Chick. And this is Where There's a Williams, There's a Way. More about the Trotters. The Harlem Globetrotters played their first game in 1927, a time when other barnstorming basketball teams also called themselves Globetrotters to sound as if they'd travel the world. Barnstorming teams did travel a lot, but usually to small towns to play exhibition games. Abe Saperstein, the Trotters coach, originally named the team the New York Harlem Globetrotters after the neighborhood of Harlem in New York City. This area was the center of African American culture at the time, and Abe thought audiences would be impressed if they believed the team originated there. Within a few years, though, the team dropped New York, which resulted in their now iconic name, the Harlem Globetrotters. Interestingly, they didn't play in Harlem until 1968. When the Trotters started out, Abe was their coach, driver, booking manager, publicist, accountant, and occasional teammate. Even though he was only 5'3", Abe stepped in as a substitute player when needed, wearing a uniform under his suit on game days just in case. At times, however, his relationship with the players was complicated and conflicted. Many team members felt he underpaid them and didn't treat them with respect. A few players, such as Runt Pullins and Marquise Haynes, became so angry with Abe that they quit the Globetrotters and formed their own teams. Some people questioned whether Abe treated the players unfairly due to the color of their skin. Despite these issues, he remained with the Globetrotters for 40 years. Soon after the team hit the road around 1927, the Great Depression hit America in 1929. People had little money and hardly any to spare for luxuries like basketball tickets. Yet the crowds that came to see the Globetrotters grew and grew. Their incredible skills and superstar popularity served as a huge catalyst for change. And by 1950, the NBA finally decided to allow black players into the league. Chuck Cooper, who had played for the Trotters during the college all-star tournament, was under contract to join the team, became the first African-American drafted into the NBA. Earl Lloyd, the first African-American to play in an NBA game, had played in a Gar Globe Trotter tour and was expected to join the Trotters full-time after college. Nat Sweetwater Clifton, a popular Globe Trotter in the late 1940s, was the first black player to sign an NBA contract. The Globe Trotters embarked on their first trip to Europe in 1950. Although the team had faced discrimination in America for decades, they were enthusiastically welcomed and often treated like royalty in almost every country they visited. In 1951, a group of players headed to Argentina, a country that had a strained relationship with America. But it didn't take long for the winsome trotters to make new friends there, which opened valuable lines of communication for the United States. That same summer, another team of trotters visited 47 cities in Europe where they made friends with government officials and thousands of fans. After impressing several important leaders in Germany, the U.S. State Department sent the team a grateful letter that said, the Globetrotters have proven themselves ambassadors of extraordinary good, will wherever they have gone. And that goodwill has continued. Today, the Harlem Globetrotters field several teams which perform across America and visit countries around the world with their hilarious tricks, phenomenal talents, and warm hearts. These high-flying hoopsters break down cultural barriers and make new friends wherever they go. Artist Note A few years ago, while visiting an elementary school in Fort Worth, Texas for their annual Authors' Day, I was asked to say a few words at an early morning assembly. The gym buzzed with excitement. Students clapped, cheered, and laughed as I entered. I thought the enthusiasm was about me until I noticed a globetrotter standing in center court. He spun a ball on one finger. He performed other tricks. Then he swished the ball into the hoop from an impossible distance. It was just as amazing to see as an adult as when I went to see the globetrotters as a child. I lay loved when they came to my town in Des Moines, Iowa and played at the historic Veterans Memorial Auditorium. My favorite players were Fred Curly Neal and Meadowlark Lemon the closest thing to black superheroes that I knew of. And while I wasn't a sports kid, that didn't stop me from trying to spin a basketball on one finger when I got home from the show. Illustrating a book about the Globetrotters was an opportunity to return to the superheroes of my youth, but 
but also presented a few challenges. There are many legends about the true origins of the team, and there were several teams that carried the Globetrotter name. To create the illustrations, I relied on photographs that ran in newspapers, programs that were handed out at the games, and other publications and advertisements of the time. The biggest challenge was trying to portray the various team uniforms throughout the years. This, the design of which seemed to change with the wind. The black and white photography in the 1930s and 40s also made it difficult to determine whether a jersey would have been blue or red. In the end, I made educated guesses based on solid research, especially when trying to determine the exact date those white striped shorts first appeared. Team members changed too. And since Swish is the story of a historic basketball team, and less about specific players, I didn't include numbers on jerseys to avoid identifying someone not mentioned in the text. Although in the final spread, I did include Bob Carstens, one of the few white players, and Lynette Woodward, the first female player. Most of the stories I've written and or illustrated have been about the lives of little known African American historical figures who have changed, who have overcome great obstacles to make important contributions to our world. The Globetrotters certainly aren't unknown, but their story of hard work, perseverance, and using their talents to outshine the barriers of racial injustice set an example for kids to live by. My hope is that Swish demonstrates for children and everyone the heights they can reach even when it feels like the world's against them. Did you know? The first basketballs were colored brown. However, a brown ball can be difficult for both players and fans to see. To increase ball visibility, coach Tony Hinkle of Butler University came up with an idea to develop an orange ball in 1957.